Many people report dog barking to be the most annoying thing their dog does, but ironically, humans and the human environment is one of the main reasons why dogs bark in the first place. Today we're taking a deep dive into the history of dog barking all the way back to their ancestors. If you're interested, interested in the history of dog barking, make sure you keep watching. Let's get started. What's up guys, it's Jenna with Dog Liaison where I coach you on how to treat your dog's mental health needs and on this channel we break down scientific research in order to inform and educate us on how to train dogs. Today we are reviewing why and how dog barking became a trademark of dogs specifically. If you're interested in any of the resources, they're all in the description box below, but let's get into it. In the 90s, ethologists like Ray and Lorna Coppinger argued that dog barking happened as a byproduct of domestication by accident almost. They argued that when we looked at wolves and their other relatives like jackals and foxes, the lack of barking was so significant in those species that it seems unusual and perceivably inexplicable why now dogs bark so much. And so we looked at these contrasts and we thought dog barking purely acts as an excitement trait that it only is working not as a function, not to serve a purpose, but more just as sort of a habit that has come out of domestication. But as we entered into 2002, Dr. Sophia Yin and Dr. Brenda McCowan published a paper which really argued that the bark was serving a bigger purpose. They, they were able to pinpoint the fact that dogs bark differently in different contexts. So they might emit one sound when they're alerted by the doorbell. They are going to may emit a second sound when they're by themselves and lonely. And they'll still emit a third sound when they are playing. And between you and me, we know that they can even emit a myriad of other sounds under other circumstances. So what Dr. Sophia Yin and Dr. Brenda McCowan were able to prove is that actually barking is a little bit more complicated than what we originally thought. It's not just a byproduct of excitement, but it actually changes depending on the context. And the other element of it was that as we entered into the early 2000s, we realized that of course dogs have a myriad of emotions and the behaviors are being displayed as a byproduct of those emotions. So why wouldn't the bark also be emitting an emotion? And so the fact that dogs were able to emit different sounds under different contexts and presumably different emotions was a stark contrast to their ancestral relatives like the wolves, like jackals, like coyotes, like foxes, because the aforementioned animals tended to only bark at exclusive moments, mostly in times of confrontation. So for example, in wolves, their bark is very minimal. They are only going to bark when they're resource guarding or there's some sort of agonistic, also known as confrontational situation. In fact, vocalizations in general in the wild are not considered a very good trait to have because an overtly vocal or noisy predator might find it difficult to catch prey. So in fact, being vocal and using your bark as much as dogs do is counterproductive in the wild. Additionally, wolves tended to make a different sound than the sounds that the dogs were making. Dogs, as we mentioned before, make a myriad of sounds. Wolves really were only making this harsh sound under this context, and they tended to only emit it once or twice, whereas a dog is going to emit sounds repetitively. The reason the distinction between dogs barking and wolves barking or the other relatives barking the reason that distinction is so important is because it proves that an evolution has taken place. Now, of course, this evolution is not anyone's surprise. This is a phenomena that we knew happened. We've known it all the way back since like 1976 or before. So we know that, that there's clearly dogs have evolved to become their own species, their own individuals, and there's a clear distinction between the two. But what was interesting about this is we didn't know why. Why bark? Why, why would that be the habit that they pick up and then try to basically manipulate into a bunch of different ways? I mean, they didn't just change the bark to one off way. They changed the bark in a myriad of ways, almost to the point where we can't really count. We don't know yet how many different sounds of barks there are for a lot of reasons, but we know that there are a lot of different ones 
complete contrast to their relatives which really only stick in one vein. And you might be saying now, well wait a minute Jenna, I know that dogs have been bred to bark in certain contexts and absolutely that's true. I mean anytime I get a client calling me saying my dog, my German Shepherd barks at everything under the sun, I'm like thank you World War II. And so absolutely we have hypertrophied barking in certain breeds and we have made it much more easy for that trait to be passed along through artificial selection which is converse to natural selection. And absolutely humans have intervened. But what if I told you that that might be too much of a simple answer? To say that the reason dogs bark is simply because humans have bred it in them is a little bit short-sighted. Why? For one thing we know that different breeds bark at different degrees and so if you bred this breed to bark it doesn't make sense why this breed does, right? We know that it is a universal trait that pretty much applies to the whole species. Of course there are certain breeds that bark less, but that doesn't say that they won't bark. Now the reality is, is that breed specific studies as it pertains to barking have been kind of under-researched. We don't have that data, uh, particularly breeds that have been bred to bark in their role. We haven't done that data. And I think, this is me talking, I think probably the reason that hasn't happened is because it doesn't really matter yet. It's not significant enough yet. What's more significant is how all the dogs collectively as a species use this device, this vocal device, to communicate with others. They communicate with humans, they communicate with dogs. So now we're posed with this question. Why did dogs change their bark? What about the bark is important? Well, here lies hypotheses, and there are a good amount of hypotheses. Some founded in research, many of which are not founded in research. We don't exactly have an empirical way of knowing what their evolution has looked like yet. So even though it's widely accepted, that doesn't necessarily mean it's fact. You can't just say, that less sounds logical, it must be fact until you have the evidence. So this is a hypothesis, it's a reasonable hypothesis. If you're interested in finding out, make sure you hit like, let's get it. Now in order to understand this signal evolution of the vocalization, you need to understand a process called ontogenetic ritualization. This process is how people hypothesize dogs evolved from using barks in a confrontational way like their wolves do into other uh, into other contexts. The principle of ritualization was founded by Conrad Lorenz, who's sort of a ethologist god, and this is a principle that has been uh, seen in a lot of species. This is not just like, oh, we threw it out for just for dogs, no. Ritualization is the process in which a animal is taken out of their natural habitat, put into an abnormal environment that they probably were not naturally inclined to, and as a result, the animal started to display a abnormal behavior, or they displayed a behavior in an abnormal way, for seemingly no reason. Right Now, to kind of give you a story or an example of how ritualization works, I want to talk about the concept of digging. So let's say you have a dog who is always stuck in the backyard, he never gets to go for walks, he's super bored, and he starts digging in the backyard, his body compels him to do it because he needs to release all of that energy. And so he's digging, 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 and then the person from within the house calls his name and he gets to come inside in the air conditioning. When he started off digging, he didn't intend on trying to get inside to go on the air conditioning. All he knew was his body was compelling him to do it because he had all of this energy expenditure that needed to get out. But then, in the process of digging, it had this really awesome outcome, this beneficial outcome of, oh, I get to go inside. And now he's realizing this pattern. So now, he starts digging intentionally just so that the person will call him inside just so that he'll get the air conditioning. And that is effectively, in a roundabout way, the process of ritualization, okay? And so the theory goes that barking sort of happened in the same way that this digging incident did. The dogs were being domesticated some 14 to 30,000 years ago, right, depending on where you look. And in that time, the dogs were relocated into a human environment that they were not initially built for. And as a result, their bodies started to display this barking compulsively, kind of like 
Ray was or Ray Coppinger was talking about it in the 90s where it was sort of happening as a byproduct on accident but the dogs started to realize that it benefited them in a certain way well what way does that pen benefit them well that's going to be the topic of our next video what is the function what is the purpose of the bark what does it relay what information is held within a bark so if you're interested in that content make sure you hit subscribe hit the notification bell so you get alerted when it gets posted if you're watching this video well into the well into the future I have already linked it on the side somewhere here and it is also in the description box below but if you have any questions on any of this make sure you ask me in the comments below and I'll see you guys soon.